Welcome back, friends. Today we're starting our third part of our investigation into the concept of the seal of the prophets in Islam. The objection that after the Prophet Muhammad, no revelation of God can come to humankind. We've looked at first the meaning of seal. We've then looked at what I call the drumbeat of the Quran, which is how you have this concept that constantly God sends prophets of God unto humankind, and they are then rejected. The last time we looked at the Surah of Hud, and what I call the irrelevant lesson, the idea that the Quran tells us over and over again these tales of how a message came from God to humankind, and how humankind then rejected that prophet of God, and was punished therefore, or judged by God for doing so. And how, for myself, looking at the Quran from the how would you say, the common concept of how no revelation can come after the Prophet Muhammad that needs to be investigated, it suddenly makes these passages of the Qur'an, as I said, irrelevant to the reader. Why? Because you don't have to learn why people have rejected prophets in the past. You don't have to learn from their mistakes and then carry them forward into your life as a spiritual being in a relationship with God. We then touched upon how there are other passages of the Qur'an, for example, how Joseph, the tale of Joseph that we looked at, that it itself teaches that though these people of the past disputed about Joseph, then came to believe in him, and then in the end, after he passed, stated that no independent message of God could actually come to humankind after Joseph, and that this is what sealed their hearts, like the seal of the prophets and how the words of God are like oceans of ink that could be written out with pens. That if we were to take all the trees of the world and we were to actually turn them into pens, and all of the oceans were to be transformed into ink, that would not exhaust the writing of the words of God. At the end of the last section, we read the passage from the Quran, Surah 33, verse 40, that is, is, if you will, the genesis of this idea of the seal of the prophets, which we've looked at several times. It is, Muhammad is the father of no man among you, he is the apostle of God and the seal of the prophets. Surely God has knowledge of all things. I stated that it is interesting that it says not that he's the seal of the messengers, that he's the seal of the prophets. I also acknowledge that oftentimes uh, those of the Islamic community think that the Baha'is make, if you will, too much of the fact that he is not the seal of the messengers, but is only the seal of the prophets. And I said that for myself, I can empathize with this, and at the same time, too little is made out of it from the Islamic community themselves. Because it cannot be unimportant that he is the seal of the prophets, and not the seal of the messengers. That he is the apostle of God, and the seal of the prophets. Um, and this is what leads us into our second phase of our investigation, or sorry, the third phase of our investigation. What I also acknowledge, both in the prior two videos, is that the Baha'i writings, it is really, really important to understand, never contest the claim that the Prophet Muhammad is the seal of the prophets. In no way does it ever state that he is not the last messenger of God prior to the great day of God, prior to the day of ingathering, the Yom Adin, the final, if you will, the final event that all previous prophets have actually spoken of, which is the coming of the kingdom of God upon earth. This is never contested by the Baha'i writings. I gave passages from Baha'u'llah's writings that acknowledge this. So what is going on? Well, I think this part of the investigation we're going to be looking at now will actually give us an understanding as to why it is that he is the seal of the prophets, but not the seal of the messengers. I think in the short, it's that all previous messengers of God have brought a message unto humankind for their day. A, if you will, using the concept of the divine physician for the Baha'i writings, a medicine that is to treat the malady that is facing the people of that region at that time. But they also have spoken, if you will, of that next covenant of a messenger to come, and also of the great day of God that is distant upon the horizon, 
when actually God will come and dwell with mankind, when actually the revelation of God will fill the earth. This is a passage which is from the 49th chapter of the Quran, and it says that if a wicked man comes to you bringing news, examine it, lest through ignorance you harm a people, and then afterwards have to repent. And actually, in, in some sense, the rest of this video, and even part of a subsequent, if I cannot get through it all today, is actually just an investigation of this passage and related passages that connect to it. And I, would, I will be uh, frank, it is largely because of this passage and the potentialities that lie enshrined within it and how it reaches out into other passages of the Qur'an, that to me the common interpretation within the Islamic community, that one need not be careful of a possible revelation of God coming that you would have to investigate and accept, cannot possibly be true. That sounds quite bold, but we're going to go through it. So let's first start with the passage in question, and I'm going to read the context because I think not only is the passage that Baha'u'llah is quoting vital to our understanding, but also the context around it. To sort of sum up, if you will, do not raise your voice above him, lower your voice instead. You should wait out, uh, you should be patient with God's apostle, not calling out to him from the streets. And then it says, suddenly, um, if a wicked man come to you, right, with some news, verify it, lest you harm a people in ignorance and later have to repent. And then it says, if God were to, have to that God's apostle is among you, right? And that if he were to follow you, you would certainly fall into misfortune. But God has endeared faith to you, has made it beautiful, and has made hateful to you unbelief, wickedness, and rebellion. And then it goes back to this concept about how two uh, groups of the faithful actually are in contention, right? Make peace between them. Why I bring up the passage in all of its context is one is because uh, the surface oddity of it. When one looks at it, it seems as if there's one topic going on, which is the treatment of the disrespect, if you will, shown to the, the Apostle of God, Prophet Muhammad, and then suddenly this passage about a wicked man coming to you with news, and this idea of contention and conflict within the community. Now, there's another reason to bring this up, because if you actually look online and you examine, if you will, objections to Islam, you will find actually that in certain places this passage is actually ridiculed from those who are, if you will, naysayers of the Islamic revelation. Why is that? The way it's often portrayed is, well, obviously people were, you know, talking over the Prophet Muhammad, they were actually, you know, taking, you know, if you will, place in front of him, they were treating him disrespectfully, so all of a sudden the Prophet Muhammad comes up with a revelation from God where suddenly they have to be more respectful. Um, and we do know, at least from the, the, the historical sources, that oftentimes the, the Muslim community uh, treated the Prophet Muhammad as if he were like a buddy. Right here it says, do not call out to him from the apartments, like, yeah, yo, ya Rasulullah, <laughs> like calling out and asking him to come out. Um, that they should be patient, they shouldn't be calling out to him and demanding him to come, they shouldn't be talking over him. So there really is this concept of the, if you will, the, the Prophet's among them and they're, and they're treating him as if he's like a chum, like a buddy. Um, as opposed to someone deeply, deeply worthy of respect because he is God's Apostle. So at this point I want to really zoom in on this passage and begin to understand the Quranic passage in verse 6 on his own terms. I want to look first at this section where it says, if a wicked man or profligate person comes to you with news. And know that it's saying, O ye who have faith. So under the believers, if, an, if a wicked person comes to you with news, verify it, examine it, or tabayyana, to make it clear, lest you should visit harm or harm a people out of ignorance. So what is this term news? The term in the Quran itself is Naba. So this, for those who may not have seen previous videos, um, or have, may have forgotten, 
we're going to be looking at the Arabic roots of Naba in the Quran to try to understand what this and other terms within this passage actually mean, independent of how individuals use it, say, in everyday Arabic language, or how other people have used this term. We want to see, from the perspective of the Quran, using it as, if you will, an empirical source, how that term is used by God in the Quran to unveil the meaning therein. Okay? So this root, Naba being the singular, or Anba being the plural, gives it, it comes from the same root. Um, often Naba is actually translated as news, or tiding, or story, or tale. But it's also the same root as a prophet, or prophecy, or to reveal. So what we're going to be doing is, is taking a concordance, looking every time that this root appears that has been used in the if a wicked man come to you with Naba, and try to unfold, if you will, a drop-down menu of all the instances that this actually appears. Okay, the first is from chapter 5, verse 27. So what is this? This is the story of the son of Adam. So this is a Naba about Cain and Abel from the Old Testament. And I'm going to run through these quite quickly, um, and all the passages will actually be in the PDF under the video, but I want to try and roll through them, if you will, to get a sense of what this term is meaning. So this is a Naba about Cain and Abel. Uh, it is assumed often that this is actually referring to 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 4. So this is, again, the story of David, the Anointed One, the Beloved of God. We have Cain and Abel, we have David, and we have the story of Abraham. If you will, the Neba Ibrahim. But we have this individual who God has revealed his signs unto, right? And this is a story about this individual. So has not this Naba, this tiding, this news, this story, of those who came before reached the people? And what are those? The people of Noah, of Ad, of Thamud, of Abraham, the men of Midian, and the cities overthrown. Right? To them came their messengers with clear signs. So once again we have this concept of uh, Abraham, Noah, Shweib, Saleh, right? We have all these uh, prophetic figures. Chapter 10, verse 71. Relate unto them the story of Noah. Relate unto them the Naba of Noah. So we have, again, another prophetic figure. It's saying that Whenever they see a sign from God, they say, ah, this is nothing but magic. This is like when we were looking at, if you will, the Surah of Hud, the other one of those objections that are put forth by those unto whom comes a message from God. And then it says they reject such warnings, right, and follow their own lusts. And this is the story, again, that we see from the Surah of Hud, where individuals will follow their own desires as opposed to the truth because one benefits them more. And then it says already they've come to them recitals. And what are these recitals? They are wisdom, mature wisdom, right, that they can actually check the truth of. These are, if you look into the passage and the surrounding material, messages from God from the past. Tidings, if you will, that have, uh, but the warners profit them not, right? It was the purpose of the Prophet Muhammad to actually warn the people. I am but a warner, he says. So once again, we have this concept of the Nabat being actually applied to Messages from God unto those who we sent our signs, unto those who we sent to warn Abraham, Lot, Noah, etc. So what are these recitals? Well, actually what we have here is, once again, a mini surah of Hud, if you will, in uh, Surah 54. We start with the story in verse, verse 9 of Noah, but they said before them the people of Noah rejected their messenger. It continues on, we have, for example, in 17 to 26, we have the people of Ad and Thamud, right? It says that, you know, the people of Ad rejected the truth, how terrible was my penalty. It then continues on, those of Thamud also rejected their warners. It then continues on, we go into, from Surah, sorry, Surah 54, <laughs> verses 32 to 37 and 40, we actually have the people of Lot. This is what... Um, why I said it's kind of like another surah of Hood. We actually have all of these recitals, and what are those recitals? Those are the recitals of prior unveilings of God to humankind. These are the recitals that they can check, the revelations sent previously. 
And it ends in the chapter 40, why I noted that quote is because it says, And we have indeed made the Quran easy to understand and remember. Then is there any that will receive admonition? Are there all, and I would suggest this is what it is saying. Look at this, what has happened in the past. Look that we have sent these workers all the way through Surah 54. These, there are recitals here that you can check. There are and that that you can investigate. And this is easy to understand. We have sent messengers to you before. You actually have rejected them. And a punishment came upon the community. And are there any, it says, who will receive this admonition? And this is what I meant about the, irre the irrelevant lesson in the previous video. When we actually look at these passages, do we actually see for us a message? That we have to be very careful that we don't say, oh, this is nothing but transient magic. He's nothing but a man like myself. Well, why don't you bring some apocalyptic, unfathomable sign unto us that it can be made obvious that you are a messenger of God. Those are lessons, admonitions here, that actually the Islamic community, those who follow the Qur'an, O ye who believe, must take into their hearts. But that itself can only be meaningful or important if it's possible that you could do it again. You don't warn an, a group of people about something that could never happen to them. You don't admonish them about something that they don't need to change. Again, we'll continue on. This is a story that we relate unto you. Okay? So, and when we continue, what do we have? We actually have here uh, the story of those who were punished by God for rejecting their messengers. And then it continues to go to the story of Moses. So in this case, we relate stories. So in these last two examples, for example, in uh, uh, chapter 7, verse 101 and up to 109, and verse 20, 99 to 101, what are these stories? What are these anba? What are these, this, these tidings? Well, these are actually tidings being directly given by God to humankind. So God here in the Quran is saying, this is a tiding, and this tiding, once again, is my message unto you. And what are the stories that we actually find? Well, we find out that there are actually stories about Moses and Pharaoh and the story of the calf. So the coming of Moses unto Pharaoh, that revelation unto Pharaoh, and the testing of Pharaoh, and then also the story of the calf, which is actually when Moses is on Mount Sinai, receiving revelation, and how the people turned away from the truth of God unto the, to a golden calf of their own design. Uh, chapter 28, verse 3. We rehearse to thee some of the story of Moses and Pharaoh. The Nabat, Musa, wal Fir'aun. The story of Moses and Pharaoh. Again, that same thing. Where do we find that story? We find that story in the Old Testament. We find it reference in reference within the New Testament, and we find that story once again within the Quran. These are the stories related unto humankind by God through his messengers. When it says you have already received the account of these messengers, that word is the account is Naba. So recitals, tidings, news, account. But what is that account? That is a revelation of the life of a prophets and their rejection by a community for selfish desires. That lesson that isn't irrelevant, I'm contending, that is actually vital for those who are the readers of the Qur'an to take into their heart. What is this again? This is the drumbeat of the Qur'an. This is potentially an irrelevant lesson, right? Because you have that there is a message that has already been told to you. A revealing from God to humankind, a naba from God to humankind. Or at least a story about what? What is, the, what is the news? What is the tidings? What is the recital about? About a community who had a message come to them from God. Once again, in every instance so far that we've seen, it's of this category. That that message came to them and they rejected. And once again, what do we see? We have a reason for rejection. Shall a mere human being direct us? That is exactly like the theme that we've seen several times in this video and that we saw when we were examining the Surah of Hud in part two of the Seal of the Prophets. That a message comes from God unto humankind 
and there's a whole host of rejections listed within the Quran, well, why doesn't he come with some manifest obvious sign? Why does an angel come down? Why doesn't he come down with a, with a glorious book radiating between his hands? Well, we already knew this person. We've known him our whole life. This individual is a mere human. I'm not going to follow him. Look at the people that are actually following them. They're very lowly. They have no standing in our community. And this individual has no obvious manifest power. These are the resounding and repeating rejections within the Quran that are recorded in the Quran which cannot be an irrelevant lesson. And here it's saying these are the stories, right, of those who rejected the Naba. What does the Naba relate to? Up to this point, nothing ever except the revelation of God unto humankind. And it encodes repeatedly over and over the rejection of humankind by not truly investigating and harming a people. So the next category, again, we are still looking at instances of the word naba, or plural, and ba, which is translated so far as stories, tales, recitals. And in this case, it's it tells in chapter 12, verses, 190, verses 99 to 102, of the story of Joseph. And it talks about how when his family come to him in Egypt and lay prostrate before him. What happens is, is as it goes through and it has this conversation between Joseph, right, and God, where he says, Oh my Lord, thou hast indeed bestowed upon me some power. This is in, again, verse uh, 101. And it says, And taught me something of the interpretation of dreams and events. O thou creator of the heavens and the earth, thou art my protector in this world and hereafter. Take thou my soul at death as one submitting to thy will, as a Muslim, and unite me with the righteous. Then in verse 102 it says, Such is one of the stories, and ba, that same root, of what happened, unseen, which we reveal by inspiration unto thee. So in this case, this is a part of the life and story of Joseph, that is being a moment in the life of that blessed individual that is being unveiled to the humankind within the Quran. So this Naba is actually part of the Quran. That's actually what it is. We continue. Verse 18, sorry, chapter 18, verses 9 to 17. And this is what's called the youths of the cave, the story of the companions of the cave, where these enter into the cave, and it says, and I'm not going to go through the whole story, but something it says, where ye relate to thee their story in truth. We relate to thee their story. So what is it that, and that's the case where we actually have this term, Naba'um, their story. Where is this story being expressed? It's being expressed in the Quran. The relating, the tithing that's coming, the nabat that's coming, is through a nabi, a prophet, from God unto humankind. As we continue, chapter 3, verse 44. Okay, here it says, This is part of the tidings of things unseen which we reveal unto you. Where it says, this is the part of, this is from the tidings of the unseen, and Ba'al Ghayb, the unseen tidings, the hidden tidings, which we reveal unto ye. And it is actually about Mary, the mother of Jesus Christ. Where it says, Behold, the angel said to him, O Mary, God giveth thee glad tidings of a word coming unto from him. His name will be Christ, Jesus, the son of Mary, held in honor in this world and the hereafter. And it says, Thou wast not with them when they cast lots, as to which of them should be charged with the care of Mary. So it's talking about this communication between God and Mary, and a part of the life of Mary that is unseen, that is being revealed. So what is the Naba, or the Anba, the tidings? It's actually the Quranic verses itself. We're now jumping to a section called the Great News. And this is a quite different category. So what do we have so far just to take, if you will, stock of it? We have a whole series of the uses of this term Naba carried out, and they're all about the prophet Abraham, Noah, 
about the stories of the people of Ar and Thamud. You actually have uh, communications about Joseph, all about prophetic figures related to the life of David. We actually have, if you will, resounding tidings, Naba or Anba, of previous revelations, stories that we find, say, within the Tanakh or within the New Testament. Then you actually have a sub second uh, subset of actually those which are unseen, those which are revealed unto humankind only within the Quran. So the Anba, the tidings, these stories are actually part of the Quran itself. But we're going to move to another section, which is the great news, the great tidings, if you will. What is this day in the Quran? What is this day when the, when the, if you look into the context, where the idols will be asked if they had led astray humankind, where people will be asked of their deeds, and no one will be able to actually, if you will, stand for another. When those who have repented, believed, and worked righteousness will have their hopes among them who achieve salvation. What, what is the day being talked about here? It's the day of God. So this is the story of the day of God. The tale of the day of God itself is a Naba. So we have story, what does Naba mean so far? Story of prophets, hidden stories that are actually the Quranic revelations themselves, and then the day of God, the story of the day of God, is a Naba. Okay? And a Naba is that which a Nabi brings, it is a prophetic utterance about prophets and about the final day of God. But we're going to move on. Chapter 78, Surah 78 of the Quran, is itself called an naba the tiding, the great news. So we're going to actually look at this. Surah 78, and again, which is titled the naba the tiding. So we have an actual surah in the Quran using this term that we find in if a wicked man come to you with an X, look into it very carefully, lest you harm a people in ignorance. That word is actually used as a title of a surah of the Quran. So let's look at the first four verses. Concerning what are they disputing? Concerning the great news. An-Naba al azim the great news, about which they cannot agree. Verily, they shall soon come to know. So I want to jump ahead in Surah 78 to give the context, because it's still talking about this day, this Naba. Verily, the day of sorting out is a thing appointed, the day when the trumpet shall be sounded, and ye shall come forth in crowds, and the heavens shall be opened as if there were doors. What is Surah 78 about? What is it referring to? The day of God. It's referring to the ultimate tiding that is to come that the Prophet Muhammad is the khatam, the seal of. So the Prophet Muhammad comes and he is the seal of the prophets. What he is actually prophesying about, in which each prior prophetic individual, right, has actually spoken of, is a great naba that's coming, right? And then we have the Quran in Surah 49, verse 6, saying, if someone comes and tells you that there is a Naba here, look into it carefully, or you might hurt people out of your own ignorance, your own jahaliya, and later have to repent unto God for having done so. Here in Surah 38, okay, what is it talking about? That there is a supreme that Again, starting in verse 65, that the Prophet Muhammad is a warner. He is coming, telling you there is no other God but God, right? That he is exalted in might, and that this is a message, a naba avin. It is a great tiding, okay? And he's saying, from which you are turning away. So, what is this talking about? 
it's the Quran. The great hiding in this instance, not the future one where day humankind will be judged, which is what we just saw in the last section, this is what is judging them now, this great message from which they are currently turning away. And what is that? It's the Quran itself. The revelation of the Prophet Muhammad, the warning that he's bringing. A message supreme. And then what does it say? No reward do I ask for you for this. What, for what? Nor am I a pretender. What is he saying that I'm not asking for some reward for this, this message supreme? It's the Quran. <laughs> the Quran is a Naba. The day of God, we just saw, that great event in the future of which the Prophet Muhammad has come to actually tell you is coming, which Jesus came to all spoke of, which Noah spoke of, which Moses spoke of. This great day is, it, is itself a Naba, and the Quran is a Naba. It is no less than a message to all the worlds. What is that message to all the worlds? Again, that's, uh, sorry, and that's uh, uh, verse 87. What is it? It's the Quran. Chapter 6, verse 67. We're just rolling up as many as we can to understand what it is that this is actually talking about. For every message, there is a limit of time. For every prophecy, there is a limit or a term. That's actually often how it's translated. What is that word for every message? Naba. Once again, for every Naba, there is a period of time. And note, when it says, when you see man engaged in discourse about that thing, right? And they are doing so disrespectfully. Turn away. Let them do it until they change to a different topic. Okay? What is this message? It's a revelation from God. I was just in this case, it's talking about how the believers react when someone is insulting the revelation of the Prophet Muhammad. Right? Not to be involved in contention. Just previously, what did we see? The Quran is in Naba, the Day of God is in Naba, a prophecy is in Naba, and stories about prophets and unseen revelations never heard before that are ayats, if you will, sort of uh, uh, verses of the Quran itself, are in Naba. This is again the same concept. And it wraps all of them together, right? If God had wished, he could have sent them a sign that would have made them bend their necks in humility. That would, they would not have to investigate. That would have been so manifestly obvious that they would be forced to accept it. But there comes not to them a newly revealed message from God that they turn away therefrom. This is the Surah of Hud. This is the drumbeat of the Quran. We send a remembrance, a zikra, from, from uh, the merciful, right, unto them. But what do they do? They turn away from it. And then it says, they have re indeed rejected the message. But they will soon know the truth of what they mocked. What is that message? What is that message that they have indeed rejected now, right? That they will soon know the truth of, which they mocked. And I would suggest this is obvious, it's the Quran. It's saying, look, if we had wanted, we could have sent a sign unto you that would have forced you to accept, right? But in the past, right, the drumbeat, there comes to them not a newly revealed message, never, and they just, they end up rejecting it, right? And they have indeed rejected now, but soon they will know the truth of what they've mocked. And what is that message that they have rejected? A naba. It's the same term again. And honestly, just directly, what is it actually talking? It's talking about the Quran, which we've seen now twice in two other surahs, that the Quran itself is a naba. It has Revelation from God. We have yet to encounter at this point any use, and it's important to take stock of this, any use of this term ever so far where that term is not used to refer to revelation, revelation of stories of the prophets that people have rejected for bad reasons by not investigating. The day of God itself, the great tidings, and the Quran itself. Those are the general categories of how this term is used. Revelation. We're going to continue. Here in 
the sixth surah of the Quran, it's again the same things. The God created you, He knows your secrets. But then it says, There did not come to them any sign, any ayat, any ayah, from among the signs of their Lord, but they would disregard it. And then it says, They certainly denied the truth when it came to them. In the past, they rejected it. Right? But soon there will come unto them the naba or the anba, the tidings that they have been mocking. What in this case is the news, the anba, that they are stating that is in the future, that is actually going to be coming, that they have been mocking? It is the message of the Quran itself. The Prophet Muhammad has been mocked for saying that he is a liar, an imposter, that he made up fables of the ancients, and that they have been saying, We have known you all our life, you're just one of us. Again, refer back to the previous video of the drumbeat of the Quran. This once again is categorizing the revelations and the warnings within the Quran as being the Anba. We're going to pause here and return, actually, to the quote itself. Try to take stock of what it is that we've been seeing so far. And at this moment I'm going to put a pause, because there are two texts we have not looked at. There are actually only two instances in the Quran where this term is used, other than those that we have looked at. Okay. For those who wish to look at, one is in uh, Surah 27, verses 22 to 27, and it is about the story of Solomon and the Queen of Sheba. There is another, which is in Surah 33, verses 20 to 22, that is about the confederates seeking news of the Prophet Muhammad. I'm going to put them aside, because I want to show why they, uh, how they can actually be used as, if you will, problem text for the theory, and then treat them independently. So I promise that we actually will be going through this. What I want to note here is imagine we have like this 25 different texts that we've actually looked at. And each of them tells us that a naba, by context, is either stories of prophets, tales of the prophetic lives, and the rejections of individuals on them, unseen news and unseen tidings from God, the day of God, and the Quran itself. So we're going to be taking those as our definitions and pulling them in to look at, say, this one instance, which is about a wicked man coming to you with Naba. And we're going to try to use that, if you will, to understand that text. Now someone says, okay, now just imagine these other two texts, the one about the Queen of Sheba and the Confederates seeking news, don't at all refer to revelations from God. So you have on a scale, I, I promise you they do, and we'll look at them, but you have on a scale, imagine they don't, and you have a scale, so there's 25 instances. You're trying to find out what this term means, this term naba, this, this, this tidings that some, some person you think is wicked actually might come to you with, that you still have to look into, and you want to try and understand what the term is. So you go over here and you put 25 instances Okay, roughly 25 instances on a scale, and they actually say, okay, well, what does it mean? Well, it means uh, uh, stories of prophets, news of prophets, uh, revelations of prophets, unseen messages from God, the Quran itself, revelation, verses of the Quran, and the day of God. So all the definitions we have over here are all revelatory in nature. And then you say, okay, but over here there's two instances that, that kind of seem to do not mean that. And as, an, and as an individual, as someone who's watching or listening, would you then go, well, then I don't have to look at it. Now, I, I actually don't really have to look. Uh, it, it couldn't mean another revelation of God. It couldn't mean another uh, uh, tale of the life of a prophet. I don't have to look into it that way. So I'm, I'm not going to take the 25 as being the, the fundamental meaning of this term. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to grab onto these two and, and follow them. And I would suggest that, on the one hand, this would be very peculiar. 
extremely peculiar to do. And I would put this out, well, and we've looked at this in different videos, that this is, this is your way out. This is where you do, you could actually turn and say, well, you know, it, it seems like maybe these 25 or 25 odd cases are telling me that I should, if, if somebody comes to tell me that there is a Naba, a, a, a tiding from God, a story of the unseen, a new Quran, uh, if you will, an apocalyptic revelation of the day of God, that I should look into it very carefully before I harm people. Okay, but what I'm going to do is, is I'm going to say, well, no, um, that's not actually what it means. And you better watch at this point because you might say, because you know, it's it's not manifest and obvious. It doesn't cause me to bow low my necks. Because, you know, like it's such a, an apocalyptic event. Besides, these individuals over here who are claiming to have come of the Naba, you know, they're wicked. Uh, they're just like other people. Right? Why didn't they come down with an angel? Why didn't right? You start echoing that irrelevant lesson. You start echoing the Surah of Hood and all these stories. You would then turn and say, Well, I'm gonna take these two and I'm gonna hold them very close to myself, and then I'm gonna use them so that I don't investigate. I was just that's exactly how God works. This is your route. We're gonna look at these two passages. But what I want to do now. And I said, as I said, we're going to look at the story of the Confederates and the story of Solomon in a subsequent lecture. But at this moment, I really want to focus on back on this text. And I'm only going to do it in the broadest uh, of expressions. But I really think it's vital that we look at this. When we go back to Surah 49, verse 6, and we look at its context, remember, O oh, you of faith, do not walk ahead of the Messenger of Allah, do not raise your voice above him. Right? Indeed, those who lower their voices in the presence of the Apostle of Allah, they are the ones whose hearts God has tested for the fear of God. For them is forgiveness and a great reward. And it's, so it's basically saying, like, don't speak over the brother. Don't actually interrupt him. Don't stand on the street and call out to him, yeah, you know, Prophet Muhammad, come out here. Treat him with respect. Treat him with dignity. Right? And then suddenly it seems to switch gears. If a wicked man cometh to you, oh, and remember, oh, ye who have faith. It's actually said the same thing previously, right? Oh, ye who believe, oh, ye who have faith, oh, ye who have faith. If, if a wicked man comes to you with news, look into it. Lest you harm a people out of ignorance and be regretful for what you have done. We're going to look, again, in a subsequent video, at what it means to look into something to clarify it, to verify it. We're also going to look at what it means to repent and how that word is used in the Quran. And both in the to make clear, to verify or examine carefully, and to repent, I think what you'll find is they're all related to how we treat prophets of God. We'll leave that for now, that's a claim. But then right after this passage it says that among you, within your group, is God's apostle. If he followed your wishes, your desires, he would all fall into misfortune. And then it says, but God has endeared the faith to you, has made it beautiful in your hearts. Previously it was not, right? Previously it was not, but God has endeared the faith to you, made it beautiful unto you. And he has made hateful unto you unbelief, wickedness, and rebellion. So there was a time when you weren't endeared to the faith, that it wasn't beautiful to you, and you were more on unbelief, wickedness, and rebellion, but God has made it and changed the situation. And now the prophet of God is among you. As I said at the very beginning of this video, I've seen this, and multiple times, this series of passages mocked. Why? Again, to remind everyone, because it seems like the, 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 all of a sudden these revelations come forward and they're saying, you know, be respectful, be more, you know, treat the Prophet Muhammad more pleasantly. And it's seen, very sadly, as a way of the Prophet Muhammad, you know, trying to get a higher standing in the community. I would suggest that these sections are actually completely related. And I'm going to put it this way. Say the individual comes to the community and they say, look, there was a time and I'm actually starting, if you will, on uh, verse 7. And I'm going to loop around. So there was a time uh, when you were against the Prophet Muhammad. You hated belief, it wasn't endearing to you. 
And you are in a period of wickedness and rebellion. Right? But God has changed that. He's transformed it to a state where you love the faith, where it's endeared to you. And now the prophet is amongst you. He's in your midst now. Whereas before he was aside and distant. Now I want you to notice something. That even now, one's belief is beloved and endearing to you. Even now. The Prophet Muhammad is talking and you speak over him. Right? You cut him off and you treat him disrespectfully. You're yelling to him from outside. So even upon recognition of him as a prophet of God, even having moving from hating belief to loving belief, from being against faith to being in faith, you still treat the Prophet Muhammad as if he's your buddy. You treat him disrespectfully. You do not accord him the dignity and respect and station that he deserves. So, here's a lesson. If someone comes to you, okay, Claiming to have a revelation from God. A naba. Look at your own past. Not just the past of all the revelations of the Quran. Look into your own past and be very careful. Investigate it. Right? Because you might actually hurt a people in ignorance, like the times of the Jahaliyyah, references that's also in this passage and later have to repent okay because look at yourselves now okay look at yourselves now there was a time where you were a hatred were against belief you were against the prophet right wickedness and rebellion were your way but even now once you've accepted it you treat him inappropriately how much more so if you're going to treat how are you going to treat an individual who you see as wicked, who comes to you with a message, right, from before? And the term used in here is a term that is rolling and resounding like the drumbeat of the Qur'an all throughout the Qur'an, and is referencing revelations of God, verses of the Qur'an, is actually the term for the Qur'an, the supreme message, and also references the day of God. This is why, and again, this will come up again in the subsequent videos. This is why, to me, this, if you will, little section from Surah 49 is actually just trying to get the Islamic community to look now not at the story of Abraham, not at the story of Noah, not at the story of Joseph. It's trying to get the Islamic community to look at its own history as a microcosm of the drumbeat of the Qur'an. And it's trying to say, be careful. You yourselves have treated him with disrespect. How much more when you actually experience the coming of someone who is a wicked individual, who brings a message, a tiding, a claim of a revelation of a prophet, a new Qur'an of the Day of God. Obviously, if you should do that with a wicked person, how much more an upright, loving, compassionate, and prayerful individual. Again, something to be thought of. Once again, let's look back at, if you will, tying the bot and the drumbeat before we move on. The drumbeat of the crown that we looked at the last time is that we actually have these instances, right, of prophet coming, uh, responses, if you will, that are wise. Well, he's just a man like myself. We've known him since he was a kid. He's an imposter. He's a liar. He's just recounting stories of the ancients, right? Why doesn't he come with a book in his hands, a radiant book, or manifest signs that would make us bow our necks in humility? Why isn't he doing this? Again, these are all things that are said about whether or not they're true, the Bhava Bhava. These are actually objections made towards the Bhava Bhava, and whether or not the Bab and the Baha'u'llah are messengers of God, this is the story of the Qur'an. But then we find out that all these stories that we've been looking at the drumbeat of the Qur'an are themselves and that They're tidings, they're news, that are defined within the Qur'an as being revelatory tales. 
right? The drum beat is revelatory tales. Then we're like, okay, well that's interesting. And then all of a sudden we're like, wait a minute, these revelatory tales, the, the, that same term, which incidentally you're obviously in the Quran, <laughs> is actually used, this term is actually used to refer to the Quran itself, its own verses, and the day of God. And then we push that us all over, again onto a scale, you're right, a scale on both sides, and then we look at it and we say, wait a minute, we got this passage over here. And it tells us that there is in within the Islamic community a period of time of disrespect towards the Prophet Muhammad, even after they believed, these individuals who had been rejecting him, and then it suddenly tells us, be careful, be very, very careful. If someone again in the future comes to you claiming to have a naba, which is the day of God, look into it really carefully. If we take this passage from 49.6 and we see it as actually as a warning, which it certainly seems to be, that you could actually hear a naba, prophetic the scale, prophetic stories, another crayon, right? That suddenly you hear of something coming, but it hasn't come the way you've actually expected it to come. That you better look into it because you could become a new jahaliya, a new time of ignorance, right? And you could actually reject them and hurt this people, which Islamic community has done to the Babi and Baha'i faith. And then you actually then will have to repent for having done so. That seems like something that should really grip one's attention. But then, all of a sudden, you take this and you say, wait a minute, turning back to the Babi Baha'i faith, they actually acknowledge that the seal of the prophets means there's no revelation between the Prophet Muhammad and the Naba. So this is why he is the seal of the prophets. Because between these two events, the revelation of the Naba, incidentally, the Quran, because we saw that it was actually called the Naba, and the Naba, a future day of God, the revelation, the great unveiling, the day of ingathering, when all will be judged. Okay, the Quran's a Naba, there's a Naba coming, nothing will come in before, and this group, the Babi Baha'i dispensation, acknowledges that nothing actually comes between, and that he is the seal of the messengers. What is the Naba that's coming? It has to be this one. It has to be the Naba, the day of ingathering. But that same term is used for the Quran. So is the day of ingathering, the day of resurrection, a Naba? Yes. Is the Quran a Naba? Yes. What if they're one? If actually the day of ingathering and the day of resurrection and the great tiding that's coming that he was the seal of the prophets for is a Naba. Well, it is, as is the Quran. It's the advent of a messenger of God who comes bearing a book that can be rejected, that can be harmed, and that his people, out of ignorance, if you don't look very carefully into it, you can harm. And then suddenly all these irrelevant lessons as I mentioned in the last video, become exceedingly relevant to a believer in the Qur'an. Suddenly you have to be very careful. Wait a minute, well, did I just say, well, he's nothing but a man? Right? You know, the Bob, the Bob and Bahala. And again, it could be somebody else. It doesn't have to be the Bob and Bahala. Wait a minute, I should be really careful. Because if I say, well, he's nothing but a man, he looks just like me. Okay, wait a minute. In the drumbeat of the Quran, it has warned me about that. But it has also warned me that a Naba is coming. I have to be careful. I have to look very carefully and make it very clear what's going on. Okay, okay. Yeah, but there's no many obvious manifest signs that suddenly made me bow my neck low. Ooh, wait a minute. When it re relates to the Naba, and it addresses the issue of, Naba, of Naba, of tidings of the past. Okay, wait a minute. It actually told me that that's actually what they said. Oh, I better be careful. This is not an irrelevant lesson. Okay, okay, okay. So I still have to look into it. Oh, but he didn't come down with a book. He didn't come down with an angel. Right? Well, the people that are following him are merely lowly. Once again, over and over and over, suddenly these become vital and important lessons for the seeker, the lover of God, to incorporate within their own heart and bring into their practice of actually approaching what they see as a wicked man 
was come to them with the Nabab. How much more should one be careful if that being is a loving, holy, prayerful soul? Okay? This suddenly says, imagine you have an event or an object. We're going to define it as a gort, <laughs> something is generic. And I say, well, when a gort happens, there will be thunder, right? A tight, you know, high, high winds, and there'll be a whole bunch of electrical activity <laughs> whenever a gort happens, right? And I say, well, we have like thousands of instances, you know, like of gorts where, you know, thunder and lightning, a whole bunch of electro electrical activity <laughs> happens. And then someone tells you, well, a gort-like day is coming in the future. What are you going to expect? Well, I think it's obvious. You're going to say, well, what I would expect is, is that there would be, well, high winds and there would be lightning and thunder and a whole bunch of electric activity around it. Well, we defined it actually all the way through, and I'm giving you, say, 25 instances of what that means. And I'm saying, okay, well, well, there's another one of these coming. What's it going to look like? Okay. Obviously, it's going to look the same as these ones. You shall see no change in his ways. That's passages repeated in the Quran. Why are we looking for a different event here when they're actually all defined within the Quran as the same thing? I know this is repeating over and over to a certain degree, but it's vital to understand because people are being harmed in ignorance. I look at them, I see a mic as if you will, an inductive study. Okay, I have this naba, this naba. What did they do? What did they say? What did they do? What did they say? How did they reject? How did they get punished? How did they punish people? How did they harm people? I keep setting that all up. And then I hear one's coming. I will sum this up at this point, because I think I've said enough. This is why the common Islamic interpretation of what is coming after the Prophet Muhammad, I cannot at, at all get on board with. We're going to continue to look at this to show why that is even, for me, a less and less and less and less tenable uh, perspective, especially on the interpretation of this passage. The Quran seems to explicitly state that uh, Nabaz are coming, and Nabaz can be revelations of God, the day of God, the tales, exclusively tales and stories of prophets. We will look at the two instances after in the next video. So when I see all this, it's over. If you tell me that you have an interpretation of Naba that is not grounded in these passages, and what we'll look at is to examine and repent, etc. This is what drives me that, yes, this is why he says, Behold us as to Nasir and Shah, and the exercise of royal justice is not sufficient to give ear to the claimant alone, and the one who's accusing. God saith in the Quran, the unerring balance that distinguishes truth from falsehood. O ye who believe, if a wicked man cometh to you with news, clear it up at once, lest through ignorance you harm others, and afterwards repent for what you have done. The Quran is telling the Islamic community that a revelation is coming, and that they could miss it. That they could miss it. And to be careful. Thank you.